Okay, here it is. Here's the kitchen as it was when we first got the house. As you can see, it's a very old style kitchen and has retained so many features throughout the history of the house. And it doesn't appear to have been hugely remodeled since probably the 1930s or 40s. For example, this wall hung cast iron sink is just absolutely wonderful. There's so much about it that we liked. We just figured changing out the surfaces and giving it a good refresh was probably the best idea. For example, I believe that this built-in cabinetry was done in the late 20s and was probably where the original refrigerator was. The stove from the 40s or 50s, and we ended up replacing it from with a stove from the 30s. The butler's pantry, the hand washing sink is retrofitted, but the built in cabinet is probably original to the house. So, I wanted to show you just a few photographs of what kitchens in the 1920s looked like so you could kind of get a sense that this kitchen is not so far off from what old style kitchens were and was inspirational to trying to retain some of that retro, vintage, antique charm, which is what we ended up doing. It wasn't too difficult at all. As a first step, I just had to prime the walls even before I did the skim coating, so I gave the walls a very good thick coat of primer to get the green off of there, to start fresh, to feel like I had something to work with. I was really distracted by the foam finished walls. And then it was moving on to the skim coating, which is one of my least favorite remodeling things but absolutely necessary. It took about four or five layers of thin coats of drywall mud to get the walls as smooth as I wanted them. I then moved on to painting the ceiling. I did not prime it. I simply painted it directly with my white satin trim paint. And pro tip here, if you ever have a tin or textured ceiling such as this one, go ahead and just paint it white. It's the best option. It will keep things simple. It will be beautiful. It will be crisp. It will be right. The wall color I usually use in my utilitarian spaces is this by Benjamin Moore. It's called Soft Fern. I'll put the information in the description. It's a wonderful color because it really makes whites more sharp. And then with woods like pine, which is the wood trim in this kitchen, or oak, which have a lot of warmer tones, it really just plays off of those warmer tones really well without being maybe evidently green. It's sort of a gray. Next, moving on to the floors, which I'm not gonna spend too much time on in this video, but I first had to remove the Pergo floor from the maybe early 2000s. And then I had to take off this vinyl brick patterned floor with a steamer and a chisel, which took about two days, which unearthed this 1930s Armstrong linoleum floor, which had a really cool kind of terrazzo pattern to it, but unsalvageable. I did keep it down because I didn't want to investigate what was holding that down. And then I primed it with this wonderful Kills Restoration Primer, which I will also link down in the description. It's fantastic. I will never not use it again. I finished the floor up with natural cork flooring. I'm going to describe this more in the next video and its historical uses, but it's a fantastic surface quality. I am so pleased that I chose this for the floor. The corner closet pantry was basically a place with a window in it to put pots and pans, the microwave, oils, vinegars, etc., and then had some shelving in there, but it needed to be a little bit more efficient. So I started with removing the door to it, putting in this adjustable shelving, and then using a cabinet from the guest bedroom upstairs that I found that fit between the door frames and installing that to create an area for small appliances like the toaster and the microwave. I finished that off with some beadboard and some dark paint. It looks great. And I moved on to cutting down this reclaimed white marble to a surround for the butler's pantry sink. Not that I do it this way again, but this is me dry cutting with a circular saw and a diamond blade. I clamped it to a board to hold it down really tight and made sure my blade was cut to the width of the marble. And I cut several pieces to install here in the butler's pantry at the hand washing sink or the bar sink because I felt like it needed to look more complete. This is a retrofitted thing and it just felt a little bit like it was placed in the corner. So I wanted to complete it with a backsplash and a shelf, which is exactly what I did here, making it look a little bit more like a piece of furniture. These two photos are my first and failed attempt at building an island in the kitchen, which looked heinous and did not belong in an old style kitchen such as this. But what does belong in an old style kitchen is a butcher block work table, classically styled. So I bought these pre-sanded unfinished pine boards from Lowe's and the butcher block legs as well, and started creating the understructure for the butcher block, which would hold the butcher block up and create a table. Using my miter saw, I cut down the lengths of the board all together and then after cutting the lengths 
in their longest lengths, I went and micro cut all of the lengths so that they were consistent and square for the final structure for the table, which I really wanted to be proud of since it's the centerpiece of the kitchen and it's one of my first major nice pieces of furniture I wanted to create. And in this greater effort for the first time, I'm using this Craig pocket hole jig, which essentially makes an invisible screw hole that you won't see on the surface of the structure of this table. You measure the thickness of your board, which in this case is three quarters inch on both the jig itself and the drill bit, and it gives you the guide to do so. You clamp your board into the actual piece, and it clamps actually very tight once you make some small adjustments. And then you use your regular screwdriver with the bit inside of it and drill inside. And then you can see here, the screw hole goes into the edge, which will then be combined with the leg of this particular table. I did do a couple tests here since this is my first time, and I just wanted to make sure that I was getting the measurement and the conclusion that I wanted with the piece, which is a suggestion I'd probably recommend to my future self each and every time I use the pocket hole jig, just because I feel like things could get off quickly and you don't wanna screw up your final piece of furniture or your final product. And after locking in the pocket hole jig, I went ahead and made four screw holes per each side of the board, which will attach to the butcher block legs, and then at least four holes that will attach to the butcher block top, which will increase the overall structure of this table once it's finished. And for my first time using a pocket hole jig, I am flipped out about this thing. I cannot wait to use it on projects in the future. So to combine all the pieces, I applied a little bit of wood glue to all of my joints and then clamped down the butcher block leg and my side panel pieces. I also put a quarter inch piece of plywood underneath the side panel piece to create a quarter inch depth change from the table leg to where it sort of insets the side panels, which just gave it a bit of a more refined look. One thing I did discover while doing this is that if I put too much pressure with the screw into the pocket hole, it splits the wood, which is a no-go, especially because that will compromise the finished structure. And there I am, finishing up the last length of the base of the table. I brought it up before I put the top on it, and I'm so gl glad I did because it barely fit through the basement door and then the back door to the kitchen. I determined that with all of the natural wood trim as well as the butcher block top for this particular table, painting the base was the best decision. It's not the green wall color. This is actually a custom color that I have. I call it Orchard Street Green, and it really just kind of made it a soft color for the base. This is the butcher block top. It's a two inch butcher block top and is four by four square and I, it's already pre-sanded, but I sanded it again with 150 grit and then began to poly stain it. This is a poly coat by Varathane that has a pecan colored stain in it. And I will admit that I have hesitated to use polyurethane with stain in it, with actual pigment in it, but in this case, it did the job for me and it did it in one process versus having to wait for the stain to dry before I was able to poly coat this. And I have no hesitation to use a roller on the first two coats of polyurethane on wood pieces because the grain, as you can see in that almost bubbly, not shiny area, is raised with the poly coat absorbing into the wood. So basically the first two coats are gonna raise the grain. You're gonna end up sanding all of that off almost so much that it looks like you didn't put anything on in the first place. And being sure that you're thoroughly wiping off the dust from the poly coat in between coats with some mineral spirits. See, it hardly looks like I did anything at all, especially on the first coat. So then I go back through on the second coat and I'll roll on some more polyurethane. And then in between the second, third, and fourth coats, I'll do less sanding, but definitely between the second and third, I will sand quite thoroughly again. So this is after the second coat. And then on the third and fourth coats, I use a stain brush. It's how you get that wonderful surface quality, which you'll feel when you're running your hands across the table while using it, or in this case, when I'm running my hands across the table while I'm using it. And there's my babe helping me to lift that butcher block onto the table frame. And this is what it looked like after I was finished. All I added additionally were those wrought iron corner brackets, which just gave it a little bit more structure and a little bit more style. 
check out the surface quality of that butcher block. It's beautiful. It feels so good underneath your hand. I love the way that the top looks with the base and the pocket hole jig was a brilliant discovery and a wonderful tool to learn. So much about choosing the finishes for this kitchen was about complementing everything that was already there. Replacing the light fixture with that globe light to reflect more light ambiently around the space and especially from the ceiling just elevated it so much. Being able to reuse the cabinet from the guest bedroom upstairs in this closet to complement the already established built-ins that were happening to the right of it is just unbelievable and gave us a great place to put the microwave and the toaster and the dog and the cat food. It's just super great. And it's also kind of cool to go through a process and determine things that you thought you were going to want in your design process that you didn't need. Like I thought I was going to want a dishwasher and because I have this cool ass sink, it's really nice to do dishes now because I just enjoy it a little bit more because everything is so fun and retro and makes me feel at home and like I'm nesting in my own space and creating a setting that I'll enjoy creating memories in and just will further be more about the world that I'm creating with my partner in our new house. And it's just wonderful. And it's just such an opportunity. And in part two, you're gonna see how I decorate the space and how it turned out. And I'm gonna give you a full tour about some of the weird, wonderful, quirky, funky things about this super, super, super vintage retro kitchen. So stay tuned for that. Stay up to date by subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification bell so you can know when I upload the next video. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.